Good evening and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast. We are approaching the midpoint of October. We're getting closer and closer to the end of the longest year in anyone's lives, which of course is 2020. Uh, I am Illegal86 and I am joined as always by my good friend Tectic and Nerd Bomber away across the world in, in the digital space. Say hello. Hello, hello everybody. Hello. I followed instructions. Yeah. Once again, Nerd Bomber proves that she can't follow instructions but that's okay we can still be buds and we can still talk about some things which we're gonna do so let's do that so we have a full slate today as usual we're actually recording on a monday night that's 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 some insider detail for you usually we record on tuesdays but we're recording on a monday today uh for reasons that we won't get into you know we we have we have personal lives and other lives outside of this podcast we don't just sit here for six days in between recordings and just kind of gather dust i do that would be interesting though I, I have okay. an on-off switch, and I just I turn off, and then I just sit in this chair for mm. six days. <laughs> do you eat or drink, or I mean, I'm I'm gonna go there. Do you do you do you pee pee? Do you poo poo? What happens <laughs> during She's that? She's on six standby. Days? It's just, just yeah, like a normal I'm just, computer. I'm just on standby, man. I, I plug my little USB open? port into the computer, and I charge for the week, and then I'm I'm good to go. So, if you have any questions for a living cyborg, I guess O W at O W Nerdbomber on Twitter. Pew, pew. That'll be a, a topic for a secret segment, I guess, what, it, what it's like to be a, a secret cyborg. But we have other topics today. Uh, we're going to talk about this big news from our favorite failing company, GameStop, although they may no longer be failing. We'll get to that. They've made a deal with Microsoft. We're going to be talking about some Nintendo news of an unsavory variety. And of course, we're going to be talking once again about Disney Plus and their latest foray into the streaming world in the sense of, you know, putting new releases on streaming so uh, we can actually start with that one because i have kind of some some recent perspective here so the news from this past week i think this came out late last week soul which is a pixar movie i want to say we talked about the trailer on this podcast we did uh, mm-hmm. and um that's the of course the latest movie from pixar known of course for you know inside out all the toy stories up what have you emotional tear jerkers that make you feel like a child again it will be skipping theaters and headed straight for disney plus and I th- I, this is coming out on Christmas, so it's a ways off. Uh, I did see a review today, but I didn't read it. Uh, but reviews are starting to trickle out. This is big news. And, th- and this, of course, comes in a week where, you know, another thing that was kind of floating around the news cycle, uh, I believe Regal closed all of their doors. Uh, you know, cinemas are really struggling. We might have talked about this on a recent episode, too, but it's it's a continuing trend. Cinemas are struggling. And so this is, of course, bad news for them. I'm wondering aloud what the implications are what what this means for how mulan did or is doing because we still i guess don't really know disney's kind of tight-lipped about that kind of thing but it my guess is it's doing pretty darn well if if they're pulling the trigger on another you know direct to streaming release so i guess i can turn it over to you two for for opinions you know is this a good move is this a bad move are you going to watch it you know but let's for now assume it has a 30 dollar price point like mulan did and maybe that's that's too much of a jump to judgment but let's assume it does are you paying 30 dollars for it So first of all, in terms of price point, I feel like because this is an animated feature and I know there's a lot of production costs that go into animated movies, but I feel like probably still less than a live action movie. I feel like this has to align more closely with something like Trolls World Tour or Scoob when that first came out. And I believe those were both priced around the $20 range instead of the $30 range. So I would hope that it kind of hits around that mark because, I mean... We all saw Mulan at this point, and there's a lot of special effects. There's a lot of on-location shooting. There's a lot of, obviously, live actors that you have to get in place, extras, all that kind of stuff, set work, that you just simply don't have with an animated feature film. So... That said, depending on the price point, I mean, even if it's $30, I'm going to be honest with everybody here. We all know me. I always say, oh, maybe I'll hold off. And then the day it comes out, I'm just like, I need to do this now. So I'll probably still end up watching it regardless of the price. I do think that I'm a little sad about this one because this seemed like a little bit more of a unique perspective in terms of what the movie was going to cover. I really like the whole concept of getting into jazz music and all that kind of stuff and R&B and, 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 and soul. Death. And yeah, well, yeah, that <laughs> Healthy too. dose of death, you know, it seems like. And it it seems like something that would benefit from being seen on the big screen. I know when I saw Coco, I believe that, I mean, I saw that again at home. And I think the big screen experience for the first time viewing was really impactful. And you're surrounded by a lot of people who 
I mean, we know there's going to be some kind of like sad twist and tearjerker that that's just what you get out of a Pixar movie these days. Just the thing that they do. But like it's there's some different feeling about being surrounded with I don't know how many people fit in a movie theater these days, but like 50 to 100 people and feeling that emotional impact all together that will kind of be lost on this being a home premiere. But at the same time, I get it because theaters are struggling. We don't know when theaters will be able to be opened again. And Disney has already pushed a lot of titles into the future. And I just don't know without jeopardizing the plan for any movies that were supposed to come out in 2021, 2022. I don't know how many movies you can push out into 2021 until you saturate the market. So I think if they're looking at their slate of titles and you've got Soul and then you've got stuff like The Black Widow, which obviously got moved out and any kind of Marvel titles, I understand why this is the one that they're going to release for home premiere, but it would have been nice to see it on the big screen. And I kind of hope that maybe when things are open again, maybe it'll have like a a big screen re-release. re-release in theaters. And I think I would probably like to see that. Although at that point, I'll have already seen it. So who knows? I think you raised a few good points. I mean, I think I think re-releases are something that you might see from a lot of movies. I mean, you know, especially if, some, if things like No Time to Die eventually have to kind of buckle and go to streaming, you'll see re-releases for movies like that. You'll see re-releases for movies like if Wonder Woman 1984 is forced, forced to come out on streaming. We haven't gotten to that point yet. But my, I guess, two perspectives on this, you know, talking about the theater experience. I saw Toy Story 4 in a theater... I was, I was actually by myself, but I was surrounded for the most part by families, which, you know, I was that weird guy, 28, sitting in a theater, I guess at the time I was 27, but I was sitting in a theater with, you know, a bunch of families with like, with children, which that changes your viewing experience in the sense that like kids can be kind of ornery during movies sometimes. But for the most part, it was beneficial to the experience to be involved in it with people first of all who were you know maybe getting more out of it than i was but also just to kind of see you know in the sense of toy story it has this you know kind of next generation feel to it so that that certainly added to the effect but i totally get what you're saying about you know even for animated i mean animated movies you know these days especially have no shortage of visual splendor right so to see those on the big screen and surrounded by people who are really into it is as big a deal as it would be for you know a marvel tentpole my other perspective on it goes back to to mulan which you said correctly so that we've all seen it and i'm going to talk more about my experience with it later in the show when we get to our weekly updates but you know that's the movie that's a movie that like you said it looks expensive everything about it was expensive i don't know what pixar's typical budget on a movie is and i'm sure it fluctuates but i can't imagine it was even half of what mulan was so for me budget aside i think this is a really important visual with the way things are currently in the world it's showing that they have a pulse on the way the real world is and the fact that you can't watch reruns of Frozen a thousand more times. You need more kid-friendly content that's readily available, that's something new that they can watch, that's not like a B or C title that, you know, Barney goes to a hotel or, or, or whatever B or C list movie is out there that's kid-friendly. It's something new, something amazing, and it's fun for the whole family. It stinks that we won't be able to watch it in theaters, but to be able to continuously put out new content like this that's an A-list title, I think is a really, really important visual. So you're telling me that Barney went to a hotel and I missed it? Baby Bop too. They all went. I, I don't, I don't know what they are. They got a, they got, it wasn't just a hotel room. It was a suite, Mul- multiple rooms with an adjoining living space. Yeah. I mean, I actually, I have to confess to, you know, Toy Story 4 was very good. I have not watched, I didn't, I still haven't watched Onward. That's on Disney plus. I can watch that for free right now if I want to. You haven't I watched Onward? Pixar. Haven't watched Onward because I heard that in the grand scheme of Pixar, my, I, Pixar is doing this thing with me now where the standard is so high for them that if I even hear for, if I even hear that it wasn't as good as like the best Pixar movies, I'm like, well, then why even bother? And that's, I heard that that one wasn't take. the best. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that's a really bad take. I really liked Onward, and I felt as an adult, it was one of the ones that resonated with me. I think the best, and probably with me as a nerd as well, because it it kind of delved into like D and D type stuff. I really enjoyed it. I don't think it was like the best Pixar movie ever, but I think at this point there's like a title or two that everyone thinks is the best Pixar movie ever. So you're never going to make anybody happy. Well, so I'm about to potentially upset you more 
So Toy Story 4, I think, was wedged in between Onward and Coco. And Coco, I did watch. I think Coco is very overrated. I think in the grand scheme of Pixar movies, Coco is bottom half for me for sure. I thought Um, Coco was good in getting a different cultural representation. I thought it was, from an animation perspective, very colorful. And the message explored death very much. It it was very in your face. It was very on the nose. It didn't shy away from it. It wasn't like something that they kind of snuck in there as like an undertone. It was like very broad stroke in your face for the first time. If it makes you feel any better, I did not see Coco because Nerd Bomber said I was going to cry. And then I know if I watch it and then don't cry, which has happened before, she's she's going to think I'm heartless. So Pixar, one thing I think does that, I mean, they do many things very, very well. But one thing I think they do especially well is as an adult viewer, you know, with a younger sister, you know, I, I find it very hard most of the time to watch animated movies and be kept guessing by the narrative. And I think there's a lot of Pixar movies that ha- that have that as an enormous strength, whether whether it come through some twist or just just generally an interesting story, one that, you know, obviously taps into your your deeper emotions, but also is very just interesting to follow. Whereas Coco was predictable the entire time. Coco, I knew where it was going. Then watch Onward. Honestly. From the word go. And uh, maybe you're right about Onward. Maybe I've, I've been misinformed. But the point I'm trying to make is that Pixar for me has been in a little bit of a downswing and i'm you know i'm looking to come out of it so and maybe soul's the way to do that maybe onward you know at the price point of free 99 is is the best way for me to to, to do that but i agree with well, the point i'm trying to make is i agree with nerd bomber that it sure shouldn't be 30 dollars. you know i think 20 dollars is, is going to put a lot of asses in the seats i think 30 won't but again we don't really know do we know i don't think we know about you know how much did how much money disney plus in, I think either price point Disney would work made. out. You have to you have to keep in mind these are families that traditionally brought their whole family to the theaters to watch these. Yeah, I will say we're doing it from the perspective of you're a couple, we're a couple, we have no kids, and for, so for that thirty bucks is pretty much what we would pay to go see a movie. But yeah, if, right. And I know we've talked about this before when other movies came out to video on demand. But if you have a kid or two, even that starts to add up especially when you pile on snacks and stuff man you're looking at a hundred dollars to go to the movies yeah i mean but plus i think the christmas release date i I will say you know my situation which is probably the situation of many you know american families every holiday season is i'm gonna go home and i'm going to see you know a larger family than just you know the couple unit that i'm usually a part of and i think that raises the chances dramatically that you know, again, especially with the younger sister, they're like, oh, let's, all, let's watch something we can all watch comfortably and there's no, like, you know, random penises or something that's going to make <laughs> it, you know. It's a family fun experience that even for $30, I suppose, you know, in, in that situation, it would be like seven people or something. So, again, in that situation, you're making your money back and then some. The other interesting thing to me is I think this is the first major, at least, movie release since Disney Plus rule or they will be rolling out. I don't think they've rolled it out yet, but they have the watch together feature that they're implementing. And that doesn't necessarily like you can't talk to each other over the app. It just syncs up your viewing with somebody else. And I think especially this year, as you mentioned with the holidays, a, a lot of people because of COVID will not be able to travel and see their families. And this could be something this is like, hey, you know, this is a movie that just came out. Maybe we all get on Skype and we do this Disney Plus watch together feature. We all sync it up and then we all right. just watch this movie together. And it's going to be like a, a nice little Christmas event for us so that we can actually interact and have family time. So I think that's an interesting perspective on it, too. I didn't actually think about the holiday release, but I feel like that could probably be a very important aspect of how successful this movie is. I've, I've never understood for what it's worth, you know, why the sync watching thing. I believe Netflix, you can get like a Chrome plug in to do it i don't understand why it's not a more readily accessible thing within the streaming services themselves and also why it's not more popular i suppose maybe because of the first point that it's not as readily accessible you have to like download widgets to do it that seems like something that especially in the time of pandemic it should be happening way more often than it is yeah i I Um, mean i totally agree we i think we tried to do a netflix one and then you don't actually like you have to watch it on a computer because it's not supported natively on any of the like console or tv box apps and then you're 
you, like you and your fiance are huddled around a computer and trying to watch a movie just so that you can like have a little Skype right. window taking away from the movie experience. And it's it's very strange. And I feel like Netflix and Disney Plus should just do a better job because even with their watch together feature, you still can't talk to each other. And I feel like that could be so easily implemented. Like just make the app on your phone so that you can do voice chat so easy just do it 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 does seem like yeah it it, in theory is a low-hanging fruit and and it's i'm surprised we don't have it by now actually you know the more we talk about it and again the the time that we're currently living in like uh, if i can talk to people while i harvest plants in animal crossing i think i can talk to people while i watch a movie not that you should talk to people but this is and well and this is a total offshoot not related to the topic at all but like in the vein of like streaming services dropping the ball i cannot believe that I cannot watch HBO Max on my Fire Stick or my Roku. Oh, it is brutal. What's going on there? I mean, <laughs> what so the bad. hell is that? Like, like, it's so having to turn on my console where I don't normally watch videos. Like, my console is for playing games. I have a Roku box for everything else. Like, what? We don't have a console. My girlfriend has to get it on her phone and then cast to the TV using like a Roku app. You can't use your PlayStation. And then she can't use her phone. The PlayStation is in the on a TV in another room. Our main TV oh. just has the Switch, which is useless for that for those purposes. So, like, what the hell? Like, I, I, I'm 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 talking now to to HBO, and I think their business daddy is is AT and T. AT and T, what the hell? I mean, I mean, I know yes, it was something. Know, it was like something kind of akin to the whole Apple Store thing, where Roku and Amazon were charging them a specific amount, and they were like, this is ridiculous, they, like, we shouldn't have to charge us, or something like that. It was something over the terms, and they're still hashing it out. And they keep saying that it's in the near distant future, but like for now, it's really annoying. <laughs> but there's no way that HBO has to be losing a lot of viewership because of it. Because for me, like, granted, we are watching Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country, and we're into it enough where, like, I'm going to keep watching it. But like once that's because the season's about to end, once that's done, I'm not going to go near HBO. Wh- whereas I would before when, when, when it was HBO go and I had it on my fire stick, I would look on there and I would look for things and I would watch things. And it's not happening now until they get their house in order. So again, that's, that's an offshoot. We were, we were talking about soul and Disney plus, but that's just something I wanted to tack on because man, what the crap? Like it, it's, it's, it should be such a fixable thing, but we'll move on now. Soul coming to Disney Plus on Christmas price TBD. Get hyped if you're a fan of Pixar. Get hyped if you're a fan of family fun, penis free movie experiences. <laughs> so now we can we can move on to to our next topic, which we are going to be talking about Nintendo. You mentioned I mentioned the Switch before, not certainly for for watching any shows on it because that's not what it does. You've heard of Nintendo. You've also probably heard of TikTok. You've also probably heard of OnlyFans. Those companies are all going to come up in this in this piece of news. So there is a famous TikTok user uh, with 1.9 million follower, followers, previously known as, I guess it's pronounced Poke Princess, but she has a spelling problem. I'm going to call that out right now. I'm going to spell this for you. It's Poke the way you would think, just Poke. P-R-I-N-C-X-S-S. So really, it's Poke Prinks. I mean, right away, I'm annoyed. I'm just going to, uh, you know, I harbor no ill will to against this person, but... I, I really hate that. You don't um, like internet speak. I don't like... Poke Princess was not taken, s- obviously. It must have been. But in any case, she is now no longer known as Poke Princess because Nintendo sent her a little thing called a cease and desist. She is now known as Digital Princess. Nintendo reached out to her with a cease and desist after, I guess, noticing that she had, uh, you know, created merchandise with her username that had basically unauthorized you know using trademarked things pokeballs on these shirts i see a i think that's a, a mew on the shirt she has it's also worth noting she has pokemon tattoos i can see a meowth here i can see i think it's a gyarados tattoos are one thing merch that you're making money off of is another so they sent her a cease and desist but that's not their main reason you know she made the point that there are plenty of people who are probably using nintendo licensed imagery characters things like that but she also has an OnlyFans. And if you don't know what OnlyFans is, we were actually just talking about this before the show started. I don't really know how to describe it. It's basically Patreon, it's, but more boobs. Is that? It's not penis I mean, free. It's I not, would say. Not so penis free at all. In my like 30 second dummy down description, it is what Patreon is for like brands and creators to individuals, I feel like. I mean, individual people can have Patreons, but I feel like in the TikTok generation of things, people like those type of people are going more towards OnlyFans because I think OnlyFans is like personalized videos and whatnot that people pay for for exclusive access. 
And like a right. ton of people have them. Like I think a lot of celebrities now have them. A lot of online personalities, like you said, a lot of TikTokers, that kind of thing. But what it's known for at this point and what it's what the what its largest market share is, I I reckon, is for adult content. And uh Digital Princess, formerly known as Poke Princess, uh, apparently has a successful OnlyFans page where she posts adult content regularly. So the higher ups at Nintendo or just the PR people at Nintendo, I guess, saw this and were like, well, I don't I don't think so to that. She has been basically required to pay back everything she's made selling any merchandise with Nintendo's copyrights on them. And uh, she obviously was, of course, was, of course, also forced to, to change the name. She, it's worth noting, she is being very gracious about the whole thing. She's not upset with Nintendo at all. I'm not sure why she would be. I think Nintendo's case is very reasonable. Uh, so I think they're 100% reasonable with respect to the merchandising you can't sell merchandise with other people's logos and ip but i'm not sure about the changing of the name well, i think isn't poke technically isn't that like trademarked don't they have that it almost certainly is but it, um, she, she could easily say it's it's really pronounced poke you know she she really took it from the facebook trademark when people poke but I, each well other. but i think when you combine it with first of all the many tattoos she has of pokemon and also the merch i think beyond reasonable doubt then she's going for the poke princess not not the poke princess so i i imagine that was probably sussed out in in a legal way by somebody but i I don't know i mean i tend to agree with you tactic i think for the most part nintendo is pretty much in the right and even going beyond the selling of trademark goods and we've seen and nintendo comes down hard whenever somebody tries to use their trademarked entities and ips like, I, I know a lot of the t-shirt selling websites, even if you make like a parody of a Nintendo property, there's a lot of the time that Nintendo is going to flag it and it's going to get taken down. Or YouTube videos sometimes get taken down if there is a Nintendo IP in it. So Nintendo is very much on the ball with using their IP. But I think the other realm of it is Nintendo is a very family-friendly company. You look at everything they are and everything they do when it comes to their IPs and their games and even like down to the console, there's very few first-party Nintendo violent games. It just It's not a thing. You think of Nintendo, of all of the consoles and gaming entities, you think it's the more family-friendly one. And to have an adult entertainer using Nintendo things like... I'm sure most people on the internet would not mistake that for somebody officially affiliated with Nintendo, but with a a company that's so very obviously protective of their image and their brand, I'm not surprised. I mean, it it subliminally goes a long way, right? And, 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 you know, when so much of your market share is an audience of kids who, you know, could see, see this girl's TikToks and say, oh, Poke Princess, I'm going to Google her. (laughs) And then, you know, one thing leads to another, you know, I could see that reflecting very poorly on Nintendo, probably not in a legality kind of way, but in some kind of way. I mean, you know, the Kotaku article, I'm, I'm quoting a lot of this from, you know, it does say, you know, it's understandable that Nintendo's taking away her, her merchandising rights, but why is she the one getting cease and desists? You know, there are a lot of people who are probably getting away with selling shirts and mugs and prints featuring Nintendo characters. Well... I, I do think a non-trivial part of this is not even just the fact that she's calling herself Poke Princess and she has an OnlyFans account, but thinking about what OnlyFans is for and what she's probably doing on there and thinking about, I, I mean, I can't stress this enough. She has, I don't know Pokemon enough to even identify the tattoos, but she has a lot of Pokemon tattoos. <laughs> so like when you're watching her body, there's subliminal things happening. I mean, there's Pokemon, you know, just kind of there. So I totally get where Nintendo's coming from. I would I would applaud her for being as gracious as she's been. I can imagine this story going a lot different of a way. You know, if it, I could imagine her being upset and feeling like she's had something taken away from her. Because, I mean, she has had something taken away from her. But she seems to understand. She, does, she is quoted saying, I still love Nintendo and will forever support them. She went on to say, it's kind of a cool thing to say that the ones who made my childhood so cool, they finally noticed me. All it took was for me to infringe on everything about them. <laughs> <laughs> and I that's a funny quote. But she seems very, very gracious and level-headed about it. But uh, Nerdbomb, I'll turn it back over to you. So one of the things as we're talking now about Pokemon tattoos, and you mentioned she had a Gyarados tattoo, and one of the things I'm just sitting here thinking about is something that is, this is like kind of a tangent and not really related at all, but the most kind of like minimalistic, low-key inspirational tattoo I can think of is a freaking Magikarp, because that sucker flops around 
doing nothing but splashing and then turns into a Gyarados. So somebody out there, please show me your Magikarp tattoos as long as it's in an appropriate place for you to tweet them at me. I want to see your Magikarp tattoos because I feel like that is a dope tattoo. And also, I want to see how that would you have look. a Gyarados one. Well, that too. But I feel like Magikarp, like a lot of people, if you're, although who's not familiar with Pokemon these days, but if someone didn't know Pokemon, they'd be like, oh, what's that fish on your arm or something like that? And right. In your mind, you're like, eh. just wait, turns into a dragon. My inspirational Pokemon is really a Dragonite because Dratini and Dragonair are these beautiful, almost like angelic looking dragons. And you think, wow, it's going to be this gorgeous thing on the third form. And then it turns into a doofy Dragonite. And that's why it's my favorite Pokemon. I turned into a doofy Dragonite. So serious question. You're not not doofy. And I know you're not a big Pokemon guy, Illegal. But if you could get one Pokemon tattoo, what would it be? Dragonite. Oh, man. You guys have both said your answers and they were so good. I, you know, this is a lame answer. You should have expected that. I would get a Charizard because my exposure to Pokemon, so like, it's like what you said, people looking at tattoos at of a Magikarp and saying, what's, what's that fish? I don't think that would happen. I think Pokemon has enough of a, you know, a cultural impact where people would look at that and say, oh, it's Pokemon. And even if they didn't know anything about it, they'd say it's a Pokemon. There'd be some understanding. I think for me, I would pick Charizard because when I was a kid, I'll never forget when you know, I was, I, I was, I guess, at the perfect age where people were just obsessed with, like, getting their hands on a holographic Charizard. That was, like, the holy grail of trading cards, basically, for a while. And, you know, for all I know, it still is. But uh, I think for me, just because of the value that was seen in it, whether whether deserved or not, I think I would get a Charizard. Also, I think the fire element's probably, probably pretty cool. That's um, pretty dope. And also, if you're going into the anime, the the entire Charmander, Charizard, Ash Ketchum arc is also very compelling. I wouldn't know, but I but I believe it. So yeah, Digital Princess now, as as she is called. If you're a TikToker, go give her a follow. Tell her that tell her that we sent you. She'll be very confused because I'm sure she doesn't know who we are. But you never know. So yeah, shout out to Nintendo. Shout out to TikTok. Shout out to Digital Princess. Right now, we're gonna go to our break. But before we do, we have to, of course, shout out our Patreon producer, Mr. Ben Jackness. Uh, you've heard Ben's name many times if you listen to the podcast, and you will hear it more because he is continuing to be a very cool guy by supporting us. And also, he's he's a cool guy even without the support. You know, we've we've had some extended conversations with him. Yeah, that's one of the one of the benefits he gets from supporting us. He gets he gets guest spots on the show, and we we chat with him once in a while. He supports us on Patreon, so you can head over to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast for all the details, but we have basically three levels of support, and Ben supports us at the highest level, which is the night level, and he gets that guest spot. He gets uh, access to our monthly secret segment and vlog, and he also gets the shout out I'm giving him now and input into the weekly game segment, which I will be hosting later. If you aren't quite brave enough to be a knight we also have a squire level of support which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog and we also have a page level which gets you access to the monthly secret segment so again the details for that are patreon.com slash online warriors podcast uh you can head over there for the details we would appreciate any support we can get thanks again to ben and we will be right back after these messages Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. Okay, welcome back. We are going to round out today's news with some financial news, which is weird, kind of, but it's also more gaming news, so we'll stick to that part of it for the most part. You heard the news, probably, if you're a gamer, uh, last week. GameStop announced a multi-year strategic partnership with Microsoft. So I don't know. I actually don't know if Microsoft reached out to them. If GameStop reached out to the Microsoft, I have no idea. But we, we, you know, we've been talking offline about this story, and I think, especially, I mean, I talked to Nerd Bomber, and, and our perspective on GameStop was it's a failing company, right? And I think most people kind of look at it that way. It's amazing to me that they're even still open. I love GameStop. I love used games. I will always buy used games wherever I can. Uh, you know, it's why I would get the disc only PS5. And, you know, I do have a mom and pop store near me that does use games. But generally, if GameStop closed, those would be hard to come by. In any case, we now have a partnership in place with Microsoft that, you know, is going to make GameStop more viable uh, in the sense that it, it sounds like the way this agreement is going to work is GameStop's going to start using a lot of Microsoft's, you know, cloud-based applications. They're gonna, all the 
employees will have surfaces they can move around the store generally try to make the store more effective you know as a store but they're also going to it sounds like they're going to get a cut of game pass subscriptions and what's the more expensive one all access pass subscriptions um, so microsoft is kind of cutting them in on on some of their profits i guess you know they probably see it as is in their best interest to keep a retail front like gamestop open and also to get their technology you know kind of intertwined with gamestop i, I think could be, a, could be a big deal as well but i'll turn it over to you guys you know i i don't think this deal could be seen as anything but good but you know as far as microsoft's motivation goes i've given it my best shot but is there more to it that i'm missing i guess is, is my main question so i really like this because one of the things that i've always felt GameStop fell short on was customer service and giving them this suite of technology to help and serve people. Not only will it help increase sales of games, but it also help increase sign-ons of, of various subscription services, which if you, if you parse out all the information and data, that's where the long-term money really comes into play for both Microsoft and GameStop. How many customers they get to sign up for these services like Game Pass and right? Um, what's what's the other one? I'm drawing a blank. All access. All access. All access right. So they need to be salesmen. You're you're totally right. But go on. So so I'm really really excited about this. The one thing that gets me nervous is because what I just said with the with the long term gains is are they going to be putting most of their customer service eggs in the basket of, of selling these con- subscription services and we're going to just see less and less of available used games okay that, that's a good thought i want to i want to jump in before nerd bomber gives you know has her say one thing you you mentioned was was customer service as being a lacking thing at gamestop and i couldn't agree more i mean i'm in a lucky position and you two are as well in that we're very knowledgeable gamers we're also very you know, internet savvy. If we if we hear about a game, we can look it up and understand more about it. But especially around like the holiday season, how many how many parents, how many grandparents want to buy their kid or their grandkid, you know, some newfangled game? And I think they're probably in need of you know a store that sets itself apart from Walmart, Best Buy, Amazon by being a boutique store that's full of knowledgeable people who can actually help you. You know, I mean. We've talked about the Xbox One S versus the Xbox One X and how big of an issue that's going to be. Well, it wouldn't be an issue if, you know, you had a GameStop rep who was more useful than they traditionally are. And and I think that could be huge. And I don't want to knock on GameStop employees because I know at least in our local GameStop, the employees there are great. And if you get them on a quiet day, then you can talk to them and they're super knowledgeable right. about games. But When it comes down to it, if they're stuck behind that register, they are not that useful in a way because when you have a ton of people in line to buy stuff and then you have someone running back into the back room, then you don't really have anybody on the sales floor. And they have been very low staffed, I would say. I I obviously don't know in the last six months. I haven't been in there. But like for the most part, because GameStop's slow and steady decline, they've been low staffed. And I think getting them out from behind that counter having them not have to run into the back room to see if stuff is in stock and just being able to have that mobile device to help inform customers is going to be huge for them i will say from a microsoft perspective because i was thinking like what does microsoft get out of this deal and i think it's twofold so one microsoft just recently announced within the last six months to a year that they were going to close all of the microsoft stores basically around the, the United States. I think they might have some flagship ones still open, but for the most part, the Microsoft stores that you would see in malls are more or less gone now. And I think that was a big way for them to engage with people and kind of show off the Xbox brand. I know at least in my mall, they even had like a little stand outside with a connect. Yeah. And Same here. you could interact with it and you could play games and it was right there, right in front of you, really big storefront, really loud and vibrant. And without that kind of presence, you kind of you miss that a little bit. So, yeah, Microsoft is giving up a cut of the subscription profits that they make. Sorry, that was the dog. Um, But they're also gaining more visibility because you can't tell me that now GameStop reps, we've seen them push the Power Up Pro rewards cards and right. they basically shove it down your throat because they have to. Like it's nothing with the employees, but like that's what they're told to do. I can't imagine that Microsoft products will not 
be the the marquee thing that they're trying to sell you on now. So I think it's very smart from Microsoft's perspective. I think it's very smart from GameStop's perspective because it keeps them literally in the game. If you look at even the financials of this, like they're literally getting some kind of profit sharing on everything Microsoft that they sell gaming wise. And I think for a company that's been struggling, that is an infusion of cash, especially when you're looking at these monthly payment plans. I mean, it's not just like a one-time drip feed. It's a constant infusion right. of cash as more people move to the subscription and all access things. So I think it's it's very beneficial for both of those companies. And I think it'll be really interesting to see if Sony and Nintendo cut their own type of deal because I'm With if who? I'm Sony... With GameStop, like there has to be something that they can do because if I'm Sony, like traditionally when I walk into a GameStop, like the first row of the first row of things, and and I, I know that they must be play, paying for like product placement. The first thing you see usually when you walk into GameStop is either Nintendo or PlayStation, and Xbox has, in the last like five ten years, kind of been pushed towards the back. I wonder if PlayStation's got to do something. Because, I mean, Microsoft's making a very strategic attack on one of the only nationwide chains of gaming stores. Because like you said, what's left? Walmart and Best Buy and Target are very kind of hands off and not really known for being like a gaming spot. Well, and and you you raise a bunch of good points. I mean, first of all, yeah, I I didn't want to make it sound like, uh, you know, I wasn't trying to slam on GameStop employees. Every GameStop employee I've ever interacted with, A, has been super nice and B, has been super knowledgeable at least from as far as i've asked them about games you know they're they're there because they like games and that's why they should be there i think microsoft as as both of you have said in your own ways i mean i think not only is it an opportunity for them to to have sale literally salesmen out there selling these subscription passes which i think there's some salesmanship required there i think there's a lot of people who would say i don't know if i want to be on the hook for this thing and they need someone to give them that little push and, and gamestop employees could be that but i also think that Microsoft sees, you know, in light of closing their Microsoft stores, they see an opportunity to take an existing store with an existing distribution and streamline it using their own products, you know, which is for one, that's a showcase for their own products and their effectiveness. But it's also, you know, they're buying a fixer upper, essentially, and they're going to fix it up. And I have faith in them to do that. And, and uh, you know, I really hope that they do. But I think what Tactic said, you know, rings true for me, which is that I hope, I hope it doesn't change to the extent that it doesn't well, it doesn't become as viable financial proposition for me the end user going there and buying used games you know i doubt that part of it would change but especially if you see sony and nintendo try and get skin in the game then suddenly gamestop's the most popular kid in town and then who knows what will happen i'll be curious to see like you said you know what the uh, what the response of sony is i mean this this whole lead up to the next gen release has, has been something of a chess game between the two and for all we know they're plotting their next move right now and they're saying how do we respond to this sony doesn't have a storefront either you know microsoft had a storefront to try and rival apples but i think what wound up happening like you said was that the video games kind of took the, took center stage on that and they wound up not being as viable as storefronts but you know they wanted somewhere to showcase their games sony doesn't have nationwide stores like that and they might be looking for the same thing i think they have wider visibility generally speaking but who knows you know they might want to get skin in the game on this too nintendo i would i would be less sure of them doing this i think nintendo has just always been perfectly happy with kind of being in their own corner on things and i'm not sure that'll change but the two the two big boys are are squaring up i would say so we'll be keeping an eye on this if you're a stock guy you know i'm sure gamestop's stock has already surged but i already bought one single share Tactic has uh, now is a part owner of GameStop. He's officially, he is a wolf of Wall Street. He's coming right. for you, making those millions, $1 at a time. Buy low, I guess. Although, I'm, again, I doubt it's low now, but... It's $11. Buy, buy, buy low, it might, it might go up. So that concludes the news for us today, but we're going to go into our What Are You Up To segment of the show. I'm, I'm going to start this week because I want to... I want to kind of tack on to what I was saying before about move on because that's really the meat of, of my update for the week. I... Man, Disney needs to stop making live action movies that are that are remakes. I I Nirvana, I know I'm sticking my head in the lion's mouth with you. This movie had very little I I will say the first half of this movie was was just fine to me. Like I didn't really have much of a I wasn't super into it, but I didn't have much of a problem with it. From the horse in the in the avalanche onward, uh it it lost me. It it lost me big time. Uh which is a shame, but 
it what what that culminated in you know taking the first half which was largely largely good and the second half which i thought was largely bad it culminated in yet another to me wholly mediocre like aggressively mediocre movie experience that probably cost way more money than it's worth you know I, I'm, I'm saying this as a lucky member of the generation who had the animated move on and you know of, of course there are children out there who this is their first move on and they probably love it and i'm aware of that but uh, i don't know i don't even like move on that much but it was hard for me to watch that second half and think why are they doing this to move on that's my mini review which i know you, flies in the face of yours did you feel that there wasn't as much character development as you would have liked. That was my I, main takeaway that I didn't like. Everything else I thought was pretty okay. And, and and I will say, my memory of the animated movie isn't amazing, but I would have thought that Mulan would do a lot more talking than she did <laughs> for a leading character. And, and, you know, part of that feeds into what her situation is, where she's a woman trying to blend into a man's world. But she she was characterized in the first 10 to 20 minutes and then she was done, basically. Uh, that, that, that was my view. I will say, I don't know what Jet Li was doing. That is, that is the one point that I want to r- really aggressively hone in on in terms of the acting. I think the acting across the board was, was pretty much fine. But Jet Li was horrible. And he is like, he's like a l- legit actor. Like he's like been in, the, been in the game for a long time now. He was the emperor, if you're, if you're not sure who he was. And he was hard to watch, I thought. As far as the character development, though, besides besides Mulan, I didn't have too much of an issue with it. I think I liked the general guy. thought he was good. He was probably my favorite character. I have a theory that you don't actually like Disney. From this episode alone, <laughs> okay, you've stopped watching Pixar because they're not good enough in your estimation. And you don't like any of the live actions. So I just think you don't like Disney, man. Maybe in you short. Just- Maybe you're gonna hate. <laughs> maybe you just grew up and you don't have that childlike magic. I, mean, I will you're making say a compelling case. You have a good sample size in this episode. You're right. I've been pretty crotchety towards the uh, towards the the Mickey company. I regret nothing. I stand by. I stand by. <laughs> it, I guess. I mean, I will say it wasn't like it didn't wow me. I, I thought it was good though, but I don't. I, I don't really recall anything in the second half that made me like vehemently dislike it. It went to, and I think this was Tectic's problem to, to bring up. Like, he reviewed, you guys reviewed this a couple episodes ago, maybe. They should have cooled it on the chi thing, in my opinion. They they, they should have, I guess what I'm saying, they should have picked something. They were trying to do too many things at once. And then in the second half, they really leaned into the chi. And like, all the like, she's like kicking stuff in midair. And like, she's running on walls very suddenly. I don't know. Because she was hiding her chi in the beginning. And then she I embraced get, the I, chi. I will say that the movie would have been better if they had just had her be a hardworking superior warrior with with exactly with grit. I wanted more grit. And instead, what I got was she has a phoenix following her around and she can run on walls. And like, granted, I'm guessing that's more in line with the original legend. And that's why they went that way. But I think I would have responded more to it. And granted, it's, you know, well, the phoenix would have been I respond to it, but it's it i wanted more of a gritty like she's just a great fighter like she if yeah. she goes sword to sword with someone she'll win and it's not it's not from you know doing whatever she allows her to do i guess that's fair enough i hate disney that's <laughs> just put put that i know you put you put out we, we put out little like short little episode clips on like on instagram and 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 the like this week it should just be me talking about how i hate disney give really give give the listeners a, a flavor of what they're going to get but uh, that's my illegal update. hates disney and surprise penises that's the clip you hate you know i really do hate surprise penises too <laughs> so you can you can quote me on that i'm much more willing to to be quoted on that but that's the bulk of my update otherwise not a whole lot going on so i'll turn it over to nerd bomber all right so we watched hubie halloween and i'll be straight up with something that i don't like I'm not the biggest Adam Sandler fan. I just, he overacts in my opinion. It's not my kind of humor for the most part. I I like, I guess, wittier humor. And, you know, I even like some slapstick humor, but there's just something about like the dumb voices that he does that just His accent, yeah. They just don't drive. That's the the crazy part about this movie. It would have been good. Like the plot was good. The story was good. The actors were good. Even, Even he would have been good if he just didn't do his stupid voice. If he just did generic adam sandler voice i love that 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 acting like essentially the movie is you can tell a lot of very funny comedic actors getting together to have a good time and the basically essential plot is hubie halloween is kind of a 
duller loser type in the community. He rides around on his bicycle, works at the local deli, and acts more important than anyone thinks he is by policing Halloween every year. So then Halloween rolls around and there's some actual like disappearances and crazy stuff. And he is, you know, Halloween cop. So he has to kind of figure it out while everyone is kind of undermining him and telling him that he's not good enough. And there's a subplot with the kid from Stranger Things in it. And it, overall, like it was it was a fairly light and fluffy, entertaining Halloween movie. And it would have been fine. I would have enjoyed it more. Like it was fine. It was just capital F fine. Like, but it bordered on being not fine because Adam Sandler just overplayed the character. He had a silly voice, you know, where he, he kind of talks like this. That was awful. It's I, I can't really, do. That was really bad. I can't just, do I mean, impressions. I'm sorry. He, like he kind of like slurs and doesn't enunciate. Like Scooby Doo. It's 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 Adam yeah. Sandler sounding like Scooby Doo. He doesn't enunciate. He slurs all of his words and he tries to sound like dull and even like just the things that he talks about and says are kind of dull. And it's just I would have enjoyed it more if he was just like kind of a loser who really was into Halloween. Like we didn't have to make this whole. This whole persona the, that he the, leaned into too hard. That's just me. The voice, the voice made just the trailer hard to watch for me. I would never watch the whole movie just because I wouldn't. I'm sur- and I'm surprised you did because I know you aren't a, like for what, you, what you said at the beginning. You're not an Adam Sandler person. And that movie, I saw the trailer. I was like, this is just Adam Sandler going full Adam Sandler, like it, it all was. the way in with it. So I was surprised that you were you were willing. To, it's, I guess, spooky it's spooky season, season. yeah I, but I, like so for me this time of year we normally do a lot of stuff like we'll go and there's like pumpkin festivals and we go to apple cider picking. mills and apple picking yeah. and because of 2020 we really haven't been able to do much of any of that so i just wanted to like we, we decorated our house and we put up like spooky halloween lights inside but we didn't put like our outdoor stuff up because there's not going to be trick-or-treating so like we didn't want to encourage people to i guess if they we look like we have decorations and then have no candy because we won't be home so like it, it just i wanted something to make me feel halloweeny and like it did we- it did it was it was like enough of halloween it felt like a really bad disney channel original halloween movie honestly is what it felt like this is what you did to us 2020 we wanted apple picking and we got adam sandler being adam sandler and it's hubie halloween <laughs> might i interest you in like I don't know, a hundred like better scary movies. Dude, but I don't, but that's the thing. Like this looked like one of those movies, like I said, a Disney channel, original movie. We, we, we hey, are really hey, talking about Disney a don't lot. Don't you dare. Don't you dare put DCOM. I will fight for DCOMs. No, I, but I may like, hate Disney, but I will fight for DCOMs. Don't you put DCOMs on Adam Sandler level. That's, <laughs> That's... If you if you take Adam Sandler out of it, the premise of the movie felt like a decom where it was like family friendly, kind of like ooh spooky, but not seriously spooky. You know what I mean? That's what I wanted. Okay, there was a really enough. funny moment where Shaq was in it. I will say that Shaq was super funny, unexpected, made me giggle. In terms of like outdoor activities, have you considered leaf peeping? We did. Have leaf you done any peep. leaf peep? You've done leaf peeping. We've done leaf peeping. Yeah, we actually we went out into the woods and took the pup for a hike. Did some nice like photo shoots in the leaves. This, this kind of rambling now, but I will say it's very difficult. So the the camera I, I bought a Nikon D thirty five hundred. If any of you camera aficionados camera, are out there, camera nuts. And it, I mean, it's my first DSLR. I'm, I didn't want to spend a lot of money. Like I didn't know if I would really get into it. And one of the main things that I overlooked, and I just assumed that it had it because I knew older models had this capability. But you know, most DSLRs have like the remote feature. So like you have a little clicker in your pocket and then you walk away and you click and it activates the shutter. My camera does not have that capability. And the app does not work with an iPhone. Like the the only way you can do that is through an app. And the iPhone version of that app is garbage patootie. So uh, time to show. Gar- garbage patootie. <laughs> so I had a 10 second timer and we had it on a tripod and I would literally hit the shutter button and sprint to try Bird. to get a photo all while trying to get our dog to look at the camera which is way more difficult you know, he's just think. looking at the person sprinting at him <laughs> see this is see, this is good information because i i was kind of putting on before i i knew you had been leaf peeping i've seen these photos on social media but i would have never guessed that you were doing like 
dead sprints from the camera. I mean, these are pretty good candid shots, guys. It's not it's not just them looking at the camera. It's like, oh, look at this leaf. Oh, look at that leaf. And it looks very, very natural. You're not like huffing and puffing as far as I can see. Only only well, the well only the family ones were dead sprints. Sp- sprinter. Yeah, I guess, the rest, yeah, the the rest were regular. The but but yeah, it was it was Yeah, a she wanted thing. a selfie but but I said no, no, I'm not I'm not touching that. I'm not touching that. <laughs> right. Right. Well, uh Hubie Halloween sounds like a solid two stars. I don't know. You can you can start if you want. You don't have to. That's not a requirement on this show. Yeah, uh, I would say two. I'm not gonna say what it's out of, but two. <laughs> Two stars. Two. Just two of something. Uh, okay. Well, uh, tactic. What do you what, round us out here? What do you got? Okay. So my biggest thing for this week is I started learning how to code in HTML. Which for those of you who've watched my Good tinkering with tactic videos, I usually do Python, and HTML is substantially easier than Python. But for me, it's just not as intuitive, I guess, because the commands are just longer and not as straightforward. So it's same difficulty, I guess, but but kind of clunky and kind of interesting. So that's been really, really fun. It, it, it's for a project that is going to be coming out probably in like two months. So there's some time before you guys will see it, but it's been taking up a lot of my time now. And it further proves, again, why Androids are better than iPhones. Because one, they can click on the camera. And two, they're way more HTML friendly with regards to running things on your phone. I'm, right, I will well, say, I'm surprised you didn't talk about, and I know we're running a little bit long here, but I know this is a movie you'd wanted to see for a while, and we finally watched it, but The King of Staten Island. I'm surprised you didn't talk about that. Oh, was that good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't wasn't that good, I guess. He wanted uh, funny, and it was more introspective. It was like... But it wasn't, it wasn't like sad. It, it was just kind of, it was just capital F, fine. You were on this journey with somebody there was no distinct end point there was no distinct purpose really it was just you were on a journey watching pete davidson cope with the loss of his father many years right. later basically it feels like it should have been another 10 minutes if they just wrapped it up and it, it ended with him kind of stoically looking out in the distance like well what's next for me well just show me right. what's next <laughs> well i was, I I was actually was I wasn't trying to rush you. I was actually going to quiz you on HTML. Uh, oh, wow. This does not count as the quiz for the week, obviously. It's a one-question quiz. What does HTML stand for? HTML. No, I know this. Hypertext markup <laughs> language. It is hypertext markup language. So Nerd Bomber gets a point. She wins the quiz with one point. I it's think my answer was still right. <laughs> it depends on what your definition of right is. Based on my definition, it was not right. But you have a chance for redemption because now we're heading into our actual quiz for the week, which is about... SNL, Saturday Night Live, everybody. You know that show that's been on for a while. Actually, it's, that's one of the what, questions. What day does I won't it usually air? Um, Sunday. <laughs> so be on the lookout for that next Sunday. I have, I have five questions and a tiebreaker in front of me, all of them numerical questions. We're going to be doing prices right rules as we've always done. They're all pretty straightforward questions, but I'm curious to see which of you knows more about SNL. So uh, we'll start with what I think is a question you were probably expecting. How many episodes of Saturday Night Live have there been? total since the show began and we'll start with tactic because ladies first but i'm I'm gonna do some math hang on oh did you hear the pen click he's really getting into this he's going full full beautiful mind over there would you like my calculator i have my handy ti 84 silver plus edition right next to me tactic there's also a a calculator on your phone in case you get really lost okay I can't do long longhand. I haven't done it in so long. Just take the so I mean, <laughs> TI-84 and Silver Plus. I am just going to say there are 3,200 episodes. No, that's too small. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm going to go to 3,200 episodes. Okay, so I'm going to actually make use of my handy TI-84 Plus Silver Edition. I just found this calculator. sponsored calcul- by Texas Instruments? <laughs> no. Why are I you just- saying the whole name? <laughs> it, I don't know. It I don't know. The silver, silver edition plus? had the the face Are you plates. Gloating? You're gloating. You're gloating about your calculator. A little bit. I, I found it in my backpack when I was rummaging for stuff, and I'm very excited because I haven't used this sucker in like seven years. So here we go. Yeah, see, There's I, was, 52. I just had the plus. I was a scrub. See, the silver but. edition had the interchangeable face plates. Right now, it's green. So I'm gonna walk you through my math here, though. 52 weeks in a year. But I'm assuming they probably take some time off for like holidays and off season. So I'm going to I'm going to take 15 weeks out of the year for that. 
And I feel like the show has been on since the 70s, maybe. So I'm going to times that by 50 years. She's times in, y'all. <laughs> Multiply. and She's times in. <laughs> I'm going to say 1,850 episodes. All right. No points. You both busted. Uh, it's only 880. I think their off, really? their off time is, is pretty significant. Oh, darn it. But the next question kind of feeds into your, your equation. So we'll just get right to it. In what year did the show debut? So now, now you know there are 880 episodes. You can assume whatever you like about the off time. But tell me what year it debuted in, again, using Price is Right rules. And, and Nerd Bomber, you will go first. I think 1970. I think 1971. You little. Tactic played jerk rules and he won. Uh, it is 1975, actually. I knew, it was, I knew it was early 1970s, though. So, like, it, I, I had no choice. So, Tactic is on the board. Uh, it's one to zero. We have three questions remaining and a tiebreaker. Okay. How many, okay, we, we've, all, we've all had a fever, right? And the only prescription is more cowbell. More cowbell. How many views does the more cowbell video have on YouTube? I'm going to say 26 million views. I'm going to say 26 million and one views. Okay, you can play at that the, game. Playing the jerk rules and doing it poorly. You both busted. Darn it. Uh, it's 14 million, which I agree is a travesty. More people should be watching this video. Go watch it right now. Let's, yeah, you let's, need more cowbell. Pump the numbers up. That was Christopher great, Watkins great that said he needs more cowbell. Christopher Walken, Will Ferrell. Great, great sketch. Okay, so it's still one nothing. I've got now a Now we're going to move on to the cast members. Uh, so how many cast members have there been during the show's run in total? Oh, I think goodness. this is just including actual cast members. It's not including like guests. I think it's including cast members. This is... This is weird. I don't know this answer. I feel like every decade they probably get new people or they cycle through. And I don't know how many cast members they typically have. What is it? Five? I'm going to say five per decade. And it's been on since the 70s. So I'm going to say tw not 25 because I feel like that's too much. But I'm going to say 20. You're going to go with 20. I think it's 32. Okay. Well, it's 156. <laughs> Wait so. a minute. What? <laughs> They cycle. I mean, first of all, I think the cast is much larger than you're thinking. Certainly more than five people. I think it's probably ten people at least. And second of all, they must cycle through it more than you more than you think. I knew it was one hundred and fifty six, but I didn't want to bust, and I didn't want to look like a jerk, so I just added ten. <laughs> so okay, so it's it's Tactic now has two points. Uh, I have one question left. We can make it worth two points, or we can just say Tactic one. Tactic, I'll leave it up to you as the as the presumptive win. Is it one question plus the bonus? One question plus the bonus, yeah. We can make it two. Let's make it two. Uh, okay, so of those cast members, the longest tenured SNL cast member is Keenan Thompson of uh, of all that fame. If you're yeah, a he's still on there. Child, he's still on. Uh, how many episodes has Keenan Thompson been in per IMDb? I don't want to bust. I'm gonna say a hundred and twenty-five. That's a good guess. That's also. A high guess, but also a good guess. You know what? I'm going to go higher. I swear. I'm going to go... Don't you do this. <laughs> He's going to do it. I can see the grin on his face. I'm going to go 75. Okay. 75. All right. You should have gone higher. It's 348. I felt pressured into not going higher. <laughs> You you felt some pressure, but we're gonna we're gonna stick to it because I'm really excited about the trivia. So I'm gonna or about about the trivia about the uh, tiebreaker. So I want to make sure I get to that. But 348. I mean, that's like over a third of the run. So shout out to Keenan Thompson. Yeah, you're the real MVP. Uh, Would you say tiebreaker. he's uh, all that? He's all that. 100. <laughs> percent The tiebreaker is about Night at the Roxbury. So Night at the Roxbury, of course, based on another famous SNL skit starring Chris Kattan and uh, Will Ferrell, was ultimately made into a film in 1998. What was the budget for that film? Tactic goes first on this one. I know. I used to love this movie. I still love this movie. I've never seen it, actually. Oh, my goodness. It's where the head bob came from. Well, technically, well, SNL came, from, came the, from... Yeah, yeah it's technically came from there, but like... This the movie has oh, a... Fantastic. This movie has an 11% on Rotten Tomatoes, by the it's, way. It's, <laughs> ignore Rotten Tomatoes. It's fantastic. No Extreme. Um, what is love? Maybe don't I'm gonna wait. Me. I'm gonna wait. Okay, I'm done. Um, I'm gonna say the budget was surprisingly low and it was only 350,000. I think it's higher than that. I'm going to say 1 million. 350. What do you think is an indie movie? What do you think? I shot it. 17 million dollars, guys. 
This was this was a Hollywood production, and it and it actually made it 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 made back its money. It box office it netted thirty point three. So wait, are you telling so, me I pulled a Vikings? You you pulled a, a Falcons, I think is what you actually meant. And yes, you did. No, I, I meant it. I meant I because I lost. Right, but if you want to talk about monumental comeback collapses, the Falcons in the Super Bowl is kind of the kind of the gold standard. So I'm, I'm just gonna, talking I'm about call this past Falcons. weekend. Nerd Bomber takes it. Congratulations to Nerd Bomber. Come, come from behind victory based on tactics graciousness. Take what you will from that. And yeah, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, we want to thank all of our guests. There was no one. It was just the three of us. But I want to thank you two. And uh, thanks to Ben again. And if we ever have guests, we'll thank them when they're here. But for now, uh, we, will, we will say sayonara. If you want to hit us up on the social media, I actually haven't shouted out our Twitter handles this whole episode. At OW Illegal 86, at OW Nerd Bomber, at OW Tactic in our main show account at online warriors one you can go hit us up there you can read us a review on apple podcasts you can hit us up on instagram i think it's just online warriors podcast over there and uh keep on keeping on uh, hang in there 2020 is almost over and you're great so we'll see you next week from all of us here at online warriors from tactic and nerd bomber i'm illegal 86 have a fantastic evening or afternoon or morning